Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for attending Enterprise Data Governance Online, the first ever virtual conference produced by Dataversity. We're very excited to kick off the 2016 year with this new event and have a great lineup of sessions for you today. And of course, a special thanks to all of our sponsors who have helped make it all happen. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the event. For questions, use, please use the the group chat. If you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag EDGO. Slides and recordings of these presentations will be made available to all registrants following the event. Now let me introduce to you our second speaker for today, Kelly O'Neill, who will be discussing leveraging a data governance framework for operational success. To give you a brief background, Kelly is the founder and CEO at First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems provider key to the formulation of math after data management, Kelly O'Neill has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the values of MDM to the enterprise. She's also the trainer of Data Diversity's newly released Data Governance Online Training Program, a seven-part learning program complete with exams. For more information on that, visit the Data Diversity booth in the exhibit hall. You may also learn more about Kelly's company in the exhibit hall as well. And with that, I will give the floor to Kelly to get the session started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much, and welcome to everyone. I hope you really enjoyed the first session, and I'm really excited to be part of uh, the second session in the DGO, EDGO uh, event. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so what's the goal of this session? Well, what we're going to do is really just talk about and understand how to best implement and sustain, that's a very important word, uh, data governance using a data governance framework as a tool. So ideally you will be walking out of this session or I guess virtually walking out of this session with some really practical knowledge about how you can implement data governance within your organization or improve your current program and implementation. We will review the First San Francisco Data Governance Framework and then we'll talk about the key behaviors and activities that the framework uh, essentially creates and encourages. So how can you take that framework and then use it to actually implement and drive value from your data? First San Francisco defines data governance as an organizing framework for establishing strategies, objectives, and policies to ensure that your data is available, accurate, sustainable, consistent, has integrity, is auditable, et cetera, et cetera. I think that the most important thing about this definition is the fact that it is an organizing framework. And that's because data governance is never a one-size-fits-all to any organization. There is a lot about the organization's company culture, what a policy means, how decisions are made, who does what, the value of data to the enterprise. There's all of these different things that are unique to that enterprise that drive what the implementation of data governance will be within that organization. And that's why we believe strongly in the fact that governance is a framework, hence the importance of this presentation to you is how to use that framework to implement sustainable governance within your organization. So uh, data governance essentially is the coming together of some of those traditionally technical capabilities around data, like data standards and data modeling, with some of those very business-driven activities and business-oriented activities like communication and uh, metrics and measurement. And because data governance pulls together the enterprise and different sides of the house, if you will, so from uh, the business side and the IT side, as well as sometimes multiple divisions, multiple functional groups within the organization, it is a great platform for decision making. And so it really ensures that the right people are at the table to make decisions around that important shared asset called data. So that's how we define data governance. First San Francisco has a, essentially a seven-part uh, data governance framework, 
And so we will be re we will be visiting each of these components of the framework throughout the presentation. Uh, most organizations, and we encourage organizations to start with a strategy in order to align the organization, create a shared understanding and a common purpose for executing data governance. But other than starting with strategy, it's not necessarily a left to right model. Because the minute that you start articulating a strategy or you start creating a strategy, you need to consider how it's communicated to the organization. And once it's communicated, then it's important to understand the perception and potential change uh, implications to an organization. So you can see how these different components have a way of playing together, not necessarily in a very linear um, or left to right fashion. The other thing to think about with this framework is each of the bullet points within each of these categories are essentially a bucket list of things to consider and how it would be implemented within your organization and what level of emphasis that it would be important within your organization. So for example, many organ some organizations actually uh, have very detailed strategy documents, sometimes they're 50 pages, in which they articulate very specifically this, the, what is going to be done to execute, execute the strategy. Other organizations, it's a single sheet of paper, sometimes it looks like a placemat that articulates a strategy very specifically, succinctly, and sometimes graphically. So just because we talk about things like a strategy, there will be nuances that would be considered within your own organization to make sure that it is uh, aligns with the culture of your organization. Some companies uh, are highly regulated. Therefore, there is a big emphasis on things like policies, processes, standards, and that sort of thing. Other organizations are more entrepreneurial and as a company culture, they really are more averse to things like policies and standards because they feel that that limits their entrepreneurial spirit. So again, how this is implemented in your organization does need to be considered. What we're going to do is walk through each of these categories, drill down into what they mean and we will uh, also go through how some of them are implemented and in some instances provide you samples of the artifacts or deliverables that come out of each of these categories. Now, suffice to say, there's seven categories. This presentation is meant to be 40 minutes. Some of them we will go through quite quickly. You will have access to both the recording and the slides going forward. And also, if, you, if there are any requests for additional information uh, about any of these categories or the framework in general, of course, please reach out uh, and we can communicate via the booth on the session. So for our first category within the framework, so strategy. The strategy ensures that there's business justification and alignment across things like projects, programs, goals, and objectives. It's really a key foundational element to ensure that there's funding and resourcing for the program. So key components of the strategy are the vision and mission. That articulates your core beliefs. And the idea is that you want to establish those beliefs around your data, which will then drive behavior, which then drives results. The vision and the mission are articulation of those beliefs and starts to create a picture of that future state. We'll revisit this concept of vision and picture as we go through the uh, presentation. So you'll see how these start to uh, create some interdependencies with each other and how they how each of the components of the framework relate to each other. Objectives and goals starts to get more specific. So it starts to define activity and how you're going to measure against that activity. Of course, this needs to be aligned to corporate objectives. So linking to the strategic statements that the company provides, business goals, stakeholder goals, this can be very personal in the sense that it can inform the stakeholder communication on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or it can be very general uh, aligning with corporate objectives. It also, of course, needs to align with more specific business operations. So how does data governance work with 
projects and programs? How is data governance embedded into other business operations to ensure that data governance becomes a discipline within the organization? And then finally, the guiding principles are a technique to translate beliefs into behavior. And ultimately, the behavior that you want to encourage with data governance uh, is done through policies, processes, and standards. It's done through the organization, et cetera. So these guiding principles help to drive some of the other components of the framework. Now, some of the statements around alignment, there's multiple ways in which you can align your strategy in the sense that you can align your vision, mission, and guiding principles to those that are explicitly stated within your own organization. So this is, think about this as kind of a, a tiering effect or a cascading effect where you have your corporate or enterprise vision and mission. Maybe you even have divisional visions, missions, and guiding principles. And those for data governance should align to your divisions and to the enterprise as appropriate. So that there can be this line of sight, if you will, between what the data governance program does and how it impacts the organization. So that alignment can occur in multiple ways. And also, just remember that if your starting point is more, is, is smaller in scope in the sense that maybe you're starting with a specific division or region, not the enterprise, that's also okay. So then when you are going through and establishing your vision, your mission, your alignment with objectives and business operations, it's done on that divisional level. Always remember, however, that you have an enterprise to consider. So anyway, the strategy needs to work within the scope of your organization. And we'll talk a bit more about guiding principles as we get into the uh, discussion around policies, processes, and standards. So we're going to take an example now of how you would align data governance with corporate objectives. We're not going to go into each of these categories, uh, so just suffice to say that this would be a, a standard statement of corporate objectives where there's a focus on the client, a focus on core capabilities, um, articulation around the importance of uh, tactical execution, maintenance of the brand, uh, enforcement of the people, or sorry, uh, endorsement of the people, and support of the people. So just keep these categories in mind as we go through this next example. What we want to do is we want to take your vision, take your mission, and discuss how it drives those corporate objectives. So here we just have an example. Again, we're trying to make this really practical and usable for you. So in this instance, the vision talks about best-in-class client and account data capability that facilitates strategic objectives, positive impact, and management of risk. So it's linking those corporate objectives from the very beginning and from the articulation of that vision statement. From a mission perspective, then you go to that next level of detail in the sense of in order to execute the vision, we are going to create a culture that recognizes data as a corporate asset. So it gets a little bit more practical and tactical, whereas the vision statement is very lofty. And then we want to get specific into how it actually drives and facilitates and, and supports those corporate objectives. So uh, if we just take the first one as an example, data governance uh, improves and uh, uh, aligns with client satisfaction because through improved speed to delivery on products, address change processing, online account management, et cetera, it is easier for our company to do business with clients and partners, which therefore drives client satisfaction. So again, what we want to do is take these concepts that are specific to data governance and link them directly through these stated uh, ties to the different business objectives. And you can go through each of these uh, on your own if you'd like to. Now we want to look at what uh, is a technique called business information requirements. This is another technique to start aligning your output of data governance to the goals and requirements of the enterprise. 
So this is, uh, generally we do this in, in a spreadsheet, so it's not super complicated, but the idea is if we start at the left, what we're doing is we're identifying what the business driver's vision and strategy is, in this case, operational excellence. excellence. There's an enterprise strategy that's stated around commitment to operational excellence, effectiveness of the organization, execution, um, uh, in terms of day-to-day -day efficiency and day-to-day -day responsibilities. And then you go through priorities, goals, objectives, outcomes, et cetera. And the idea here is that you want to identify how data governance and maybe some of the other aspects of data governance like metadata facilitate those vision, strategy, priorities, goals, et cetera. We call those levers. And those are the levers in which the organization and the data governance program specifically supports the delivery of the other corporate goals, objectives, uh, and priorities. So this is just another example of how you can articulate the way that your data program, your metadata program, or your data governance program will facilitate um, your business uh, objectives and drivers. So. Uh, the important point here is that these levers or these aspects of managing your data need to be very clearly articulated and linked to that goal or, or objective. So we want to make that statement very clear. So when you're writing these, think of filling in the blank for this statement. We will use data to blank, thereby enabling some specific business action. So it's a very clear statement around data enabling a specific business action. So that's a technique that we've used to facilitate alignment as part of a strategy. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the organization. People tend to think about organization almost immediately after they think about strategy because really it is all about the people so people jump to organization quite quickly. In our view, though, organization has a lot of different components in order to make it uh, sustainable and in order to make it a discipline within your organization. So we start with an operating model. An operating model is exactly what it says. It outlines and articulates how data governance will operate. It is the foundation for an organization, but it isn't the organization. And it is many times a single piece of paper graphically represented that talks about the decision-making process, roles and responsibilities, ownership, accountability, et cetera. So many of these subcategories that you see on the slide here actually roll up into an operating model. But each of the categories are also important in and of, it, in, in and of themselves, excuse me. So starting with the operating model, and then it's important to determine uh, the escalation process, the arbitration process, et cetera. And of course, that is articulated in the operating model. But by defining what the escalation process is, it ensures that there is the appropriate level of decision making so the decisions actually stick. And again, this is going back to some of the cultural issues within each organization. Um, Decisions are made, enforced, and uh, mandated at different levels in the organization. Some organizations like to push decisions down to make them very, uh, to make sure that each uh, level within the hierarchy is very bought in and uh, empowered in the organization. In other organizations, decisions are only made at the very tippy top, and it's a very um, kind of mandate-oriented organization that comes down from the top. So this, this needs to be considered when you're identifying decision-making processes and ensuring that the participation level is one in which those decisions will actually be adopted and implemented. Roles and responsibilities start to create some standard titles and expectations across an organization so that when we say that someone is a data steward, for example, everyone knows what a data steward is. And a data steward that's in the marketing division is the same thing as a data steward that's in the product decision division. 
Now, the type of data that they are stewarding might be different, but everyone knows that there's a consistency around roles and responsibilities. Um, ownership and accountability are really important to make sure that there is an identification of ultimate culpability around the data governance and data management and that the organization agrees upon where that ultimate culpability occurs. This links back to the decision-making process and making decisions that stick. And then lastly, we look at the data governance organization members. And we really use the staffing and the identification of individuals to fill the role as the last component of an organization. But this is what starts to make, um, to identify uh, the individuals and make it really tangible within the company. So what is an operating model? Well, here we've got some sample operating models. And I've chosen two that are most commonly implemented in organizations. So the hybrid model is a structure that tends to have some centralized capabilities like a data governance office and some decentralized uh, uh, components like a um, cross-functional data governance working group. Um, the federated operating model is really a more complex representation of a hybrid model that tends to work in larger organizations where they're might be multiple geographies, um, multiple lines of business, et cetera, where it's difficult to coordinate all of those different uh, uh, organizations. And they might have actually different requirements, different needs, and different priorities, which make it more appropriate to govern data in a federated way uh, rather than trying to uh, have a uh, mandated one way across the organization. Now, in a federated model, you also see a couple of additional layers of that unification or centralization where you've got the uh, enterprise understanding of what data governance means via an enterprise data governance office as well as potentially divisional data governance offices. But anyway, these are just sample operating model, so just point what to uh, consider an operating model could look like within your organization, and then how this is used as a communication platform, et cetera. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about as part of the organization is how you establish ownership and accountability, and many times RACIs are great tools to do this. So here's an example of an actual deliverable or an artifact called a RACI. And so many of you might use RACIs within your organization to define other sorts of roles and responsibilities uh, or accountability. But really, the purpose of a RACI is to make sure that there's clarity around roles and responsibilities at a detailed level and ensure that the proper people are involved in activities or decision making. Uh, again, it's a way of documenting the way that decisions are made so that everybody agrees upon who makes those decisions and therefore the decisions actually stick. Um, one of the really important things about a RACI is that we want to minimize finger pointing. So this is the reason that we put together a RACI is we don't want to be the poor guy in the middle where everyone points at data governance and says, look, it's governance responsibility or it's governance fault. So we want to make sure that uh, different participants in our governance ecosystem participate in decision-making processes so that it is truly cross-functional and people really do agree with decisions that are made and reduces finger pointing. So next we're going to talk about policies processes and standards. So policies, processes, and standards are kind of the stuff that comes out of data governance. Many times people consider data governance to be policies, processes, and standards. Um, as you can see, we think that governance is, is much 
beyond policies, processes, and standards, and really it's a way, the whole framework is a way to make sure that when you create policies and processes that they are actually implemented because we have linked them back to a strategy, because we have organizational support for them, because we, are, we have an approach to communicate them, et cetera. But this is what people think about many times as the stuff. And uh, so let me just go through uh, what the purpose is of these different categories. Uh, I think most people understand what they are. So I'm going to talk mainly about the purpose and why they're valuable. Well, policies and rules really establish enforceable directives, right? So we can't actually um, uh, expect people to behave a certain way unless we tell them what that behavior needs to be. Policies document and uh, make it very clear what the expected behavior is and what the enforceable directive is. Uh, policies can also create a basis for auditing in which you want to say, is this person complying or not complying? Uh, this is important, uh, especially for regulated industries. Now, processes start to articulate that behave, how to behave in a consistent way across the organization. And importantly, data governance processes should be integrated into existing behaviors and processes. And it's important that, that, uh, that the existing behaviors and processes are considered. Sometimes they are adapted. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, when we consider uh, change, the change management component of the framework. But the idea is that there's an understanding of how a data governance process such as a data profiling process or a, under, a data quality check or what have you, um, or the utilization of a definition is incorporated into other policy, uh, processes and behaviors. Uh, again, many people think about data governance just as control. Um, control is important and controls uh, establish uh, how data assets are protected and they're a way of ensuring uh, appropriate data access, data sharing, and data use. Standards and definitions are, again, very important in data governance to ensure that there's commonality and consistency of the data and that, that it creates data understanding. So being able to define the data and create standards of how data is defined really improves the way that people understand the content of the data. Now, metadata, uh, taxonomy, classification, cataloging, et cetera, these are really the uh, more detailed um, uh, documentation of standards and definitions. So these bottom two are, are quite related. Um, but in this context, we are separating the data definition from other metadata that further describes the data asset. So whether it is the relationship to other data elements or additional information about that element, such as context, usage, ownership, or technical attributes, we are separating these just slightly. Uh, some organizations consider the definition to be uh, part of metadata, um, which is perfectly okay. We're just trying to make this a bit more granular. But the definition of the metadata and the classification starts to support the way that you want to measure and audit your data because you've got the additional context, you've got the definition of ownership, you've got a bit more understanding of how that data is created and should be used across an organization. And importantly, it starts to link that business definition to technical implementation. So metadata is many times considered to be a technical capability because systems and applications have metadata. But of course, it's not the only uh, use of metadata. So let's look at how some of this is done and a couple of examples. So remember I said that we were going to talk about guiding principles again when we talk about policies, processes, and standards. So here, this is why we bring in the discussion around principles. Because when we develop policies, processes, and standards, we start with principles, and the reason is, is that principles are that statement of shared organizational belief, and policies codify principles into very specific statements, guidelines, and rules. So you need to have agreement upon the principles before you start to jump into policies. 
standards are the next level of detail that create specificity and controls uh, to uh, ensure that those policies are applied to different data categories and data elements. Uh, some organizations have a single high-level policy and all of the other rules and guidelines are considered to be standards. Some organizations have multiple policies that follow the life cycle of the data. So again, back to cultural norms within your organization, uh, organizations do this differently and, and that's perfectly okay. And then, of course, the processes tend to be activity-driven, talk about how you implement the policies and standards, and then the next phase after processes are things like procedures, and those are very uh, tool-specific. But anyway, this is how we would go through the creation of policies, processes, and standards. So in the spirit of giving you a couple of examples, I'd like to give you an example of a policy. This is a high-level data governance policy that was created uh, that is um, the single policy that drives the implementation of governance across the enterprise. Um, this might be very simplistic to some organizations. Uh, I've seen other organizations where a single policy is, you know, a dozen pages or more. Um, but this is what worked for this organization. It followed their policy template. It was very clear in terms of what the policy is, the scope, the participation, and then also uh, what are the roles and responsibilities that implement the policy, uh, how do we report it, how do we measure it, and then also how do we govern the policy. So the category at the second to the bottom row talks about the review and renewal period. Just to be clear, policies need to be governed in the same way that, that anything else needs to be governed. So anyway, here's an example for you of a high-level policy, so hopefully that that's uh, helpful for you. All right, next category, measurement and monitoring. So this is one of my very favorite categories. It tends to be one that is difficult um, in the sense that uh, it's not just the measurement of progress, it's also the measurement of impact to your organization. So we'll talk about both of those. But essentially there's several categories of measurement and monitoring. So we want to first look at kind of statistics that we can then analyze. So what are those quantifiable measurements that start to demonstrate proof of value to the organization? And when I say proof of value, I talk about how the data governance provides value back into the organization, how it makes business operations more efficient, how it makes compliance to regulatory events more efficient and secure, all of those things. Um, measurement and monitoring also includes tracking of progress. So this is taking some of those statistics and applying it to the, to the measurement of how you are uh, delivering according to your roadmap. Now, we all know that roadmaps are meant to be changed, but the idea is that you are tracking along a plan that uh, is uh, articulated and people agreed upon the progress. So you need to be able to track that progress, articulate that progress, and also identify what resources do you need in order to uh, continue to make progress. Um, Monitoring of issues is an important aspect of measurement um, because those uh, issues that are identified can start to indicate whether there is adoption by the organization. So this is something where if you create an, an issue management process or a case management process, as some organizations call it, and they can, and the data governance organization starts to uh, receive data issues or uh, requests for data changes, et cetera, many times the monitoring of issues, it identifies a huge influx of issues in the early days of the governance program. Um, and the more issues you're getting is actually quite a positive thing. So, so the quantity of issues isn't necessarily the indication of um, importance, but it shows adoption by the organization. And depending upon the types of issues that are identified, it actually can inform whether your standards are really effective. Are people understanding the standards? Um, are people utilizing the standards? Are the standards improving the data such that issue uh, identification is dropping. 
Um, of course, there should be an aspect of continuous improvement so that this is, you, this is a constantly improving process. And then scorecarding and dashboarding is a way to maintain uh, measurement of the program itself and to start to identify uh, what is the value we're providing back to the organization uh, as we have articulated it based on our business case or our justification. So this is where we're starting to share and uh, show the impact, not just the progress back to the organization. So here I'm going to talk about a process to establish metrics. And the metrics that we're focusing on here are the uh, impact metrics. So progress metrics are pretty easy in the sense that Progress metrics are just measuring back to the execution of your roadmap. But the idea around impact metrics is that you're focusing on uh, addressing business issues and challenges and that you are focusing what you're measuring based on the problems that you're trying to solve. So the way that we do this here is we actually start with that business challenge and then create the measurement and metrics that address the business need. And sometimes this process will help to inform the progress metrics that you are measuring. One of the challenges of progress metrics in governance is that there's so many things that you can measure. This process helps you to identify those metrics and KPIs that are important to solving and addressing that business need. So the way that we go through this process is to start with the issue or the business need. And the point is to clarify the issue. What is meant by the issue? Um, why is that issue important? Um, what is the change that you would like to see? So then we start to move into the goals. And uh, just by going through a detailed line of questioning of what the issue is and what the goal is, then you can start to come up with those uh, ways of tracking what you need to do from a data perspective to impact the goal to address the issue. So for example, if you identify an issue um, and a goal, the next step you want to do is you want to identify what are the processes and the data that are involved with that issue and that goal. By looking at the processes and the data that contribute or are used in that uh, to create that issue or that business need, that's where you start to identify your data measurements. And ultimately, by going through a process like this, then you can easily demonstrate the impact of the data improvement to the organization. So let's just take an example of this so that you can kind of see what this means. So in this instance, what we've said is we've got some goals there on the left-hand side, and then we've gone through to determine uh, what sort of measurements that we want to uh, make based on those goals. So the top three goals uh, lead to the bottom line um, or the bottom line in the table, which was really the business issue. So the business issue was increasing report quality and accuracy. The goals or the change that they would like to see was improved data understanding, improved data transparency, and reducing manual uh, remediation. And essentially what you want to do is be able to identify those measurements, those targets and frequencies, which are the data changes that you need in order to really uh, demonstrate an indication of performance improvement and performance impact. So the KPI and the ability to, to uh, improve report quality and accuracy by providing uh, better transparency, understanding, and a more efficient data remediation process is really the message that you want to provide back to your organization. So there's an example from a metrics and, and measurement perspective. Okay, so just a couple more categories left, uh, actually three more categories left. We're gonna talk a bit about how technology is used within a data governance program. And the way that we consider technology is that technology really provides the automation, efficiency, and measurement capabilities to support policies, processes, and standards. 
So the idea is that you can govern your data and the, the role of governance is to create the policies, processes, and standards, and technology are great tools for facilitating easier implementation of those capabilities. And in this context, we'll be calling out the technical uh, implementation of concepts that we introduced elsewhere, such as metadata. So you'll see metadata represented here and represented in the policies, processes, and standards, because here we're talking about metadata as a tool to create a tech, uh, repository for that metadata. And, you know, there's a belief in the governance community that these tools will progress in such a way that once they're set up using those standards and, and um, processes that have been determined, then governance will be automated and non-compliance to governance rules will be virtually impossible and will be so well audited that the enforcement of governance is very easy. Okay, so quickly, what are the categories of technology that are primarily supporting governance? Well, you have collaboration and knowledge management tools, and these really assist in involvement, participation, and consistency across an organization. So having a place where all of the data governance uh, um, artifacts and uh, definitions and policies and participation and all of that are in a single place, it really facilitates the adoption of those uh, stated policies and processes and, and uh, roles and responsibilities. Now, data mastering and sharing, so this is the concept of master data management as well as some data integration. And the idea is that you want to leverage technology to ensure data consistency across the enterprise. And it's a way of implementing those business rules that establish the requirements for data accuracy and data movement. Um, data architecture, security, and lifecycle management are really core capabilities that create a secure, robust, and consistent foundation for the data and, of course, support the complete data lifecycle, including uh, data retention in a disaster recovery sort of infrastructure. Now, data quality and work and stewardship workflow are those user interfaces that are uh, uh, leveraged to facilitate the stewardship activity. Many times these are data quality capabilities, so the steward has a an actual tool to measure the quantifiable dimensions that are identified to ensure trusted data. So it really helps with efficiency and productivity to have workflow, to have tools that can measure data quality uh, efficiently. And lastly, in metadata management, by having a repository really reinforces those definitions and standards and can uh, really uh, improve that enterprise cohesion that you're trying to create uh, through the program in and of itself. So let's just take a quick example of what a technology structure uh, would look like with, um, the, with governance. So this is a master data management services framework that we use to define what are all of the capabilities uh, within master data management. And the idea is that governance provides the shared cross-functional uh, participation to make the decisions about how these services are implemented uh, in order to address the business requirements. And you can see that in this definition, there it calls out other sorts of capabilities like data quality, security, metadata management, et cetera. But the idea is that governance provides the input, the business requirements, and the business rules to make that technology provide the efficiency and the automation uh, to support the data governance program. So two more categories that are both tightly related. So the first one we're going to talk about is communication. And communication is something where it really does um, uh, impact this next cat, the next category, which is our final category called change management. And communication to us is not just uh, the one on one communication or meetings, uh, it is also incorporates the training strategy. So, a communication plan is really an effective way to document what you're trying to do from a communication perspective, and then uh, that training plan helps to make that. 
a bit more specific to each of the organizations. So sometimes communication is thought of as awareness and orientation, um, but really that is also part of the training strategy. So the idea is that you want to be able to articulate to the organization, to the enterprise. Vehicles and mechanisms are really just the way that you want to delineate the techniques used to communicate. So these are things like newsletters, um, these are things, you know, you would call out things like meetings or what have you, but we want to be able to incorporate creative techniques such as using video and other sorts of interactive capabilities uh, to make it much uh, more real for the uh, recipient so that you're not just emailing things out. And of course, we need to create reusable content and identify accountability for the different aspects of communication. Um, communication is a really big category, so if you don't reuse that content, uh, it can be very daunting in terms of the amount of work that is done. So this is a communication framework that we have used uh, to help support change management. So it's really an approach that brings together many aspects of the data governance framework. So you can see it starts with a statement of a vision and a purpose, which would be covered within the strategy category of the data governance framework. And it all it goes all the way through to participation, which is also something that is called out in the organization category of the framework. But the idea is that you want to create and articulate what is the desired future state. So what is the value of that future state to the company? This is the vision. This is a statement of a strategic goal and the why. So what is it and what's the why? That's the purpose. And the picture is really just that. It's a picture of what the future will be like once data governance and data management is implemented. The plan is the how, and then of course, the participation is the who, and what is each person's role within that plan. The idea is this starts to make it very tangible to the organization so that they don't just know the vision, but they know how they participate in the plan to create the future state. This is something that was adapted um, from a very, uh, valuable change management approach um, by William Bridges. So that takes us into change management. And this is going to be our last category. Um, I feel bad at being the last because it's also one of the most important. So a few components of change management. Most fundamentally, it's identifying what is the impact of data governance to the organization and how ready are they for that. So successful data governance inevitably is change and change to the way that information is created, managed, shared, uh, and consumed across the organization. And fundamentally, you are asking people to do something differently. And so it's important to understand what that ask is and how they'll potentially respond to that change in behavior. So whether this is an incremental change or a big change, some of this still needs to be considered. Leadership alignment is formally uh, identifying what the sponsorship role is and how they need to be supporting the organization. Stakeholder management is a similar sort of process, but with a broader group of stakeholders in the organization. And really, the stakeholder management plan assists in promoting uh, the internalization of the value of the data governance program. A couple of things to make it very specific. There should be a change plan with very clear and practical tools and checklists to make sure that this plan is actually delivered upon. And then fundamentally, over time, all of this should be transitioned to just a sustainable discipline. So the idea is that change management is helping people through a, a shift, but it is ultimately to, uh, transitioned to the business as uh, business as usual and an ongoing discipline. So there's two sides to change management. The one that we're all very comfortable with is the situational. So what are we doing? Why are we doing? When are we doing it? What's the process? What's the rule? Give me the policy, et cetera. But then there's the psychological side, which is the response that people have as they're being told to do something new. 
And this is the most difficult part of change management. So in order to make it successful, both of these need to be addressed. And as data professionals, we tend to be very linear, which is something that uh, falls nicely into the situational change. But the psychological change, sometimes we feel as much more, you know, airy-fairy, but the reality is, is people will respond how they will respond. And if we deny that there may be some resistance or a psychological impact, then we're not going to be successful. So considering we're all very linear thinkers, um, not all of us, so sorry, that's a gross generalization, but we tend to be more linear thinkers. We're very practical. Well, here is a very practical way to put together your change management plan as it aligns to data governance phases. So the idea here is that you're doing this proactively, you're doing it um, purposefully, and you're recognizing that this is an important aspect of sustainability. So for some final considerations here, um, we want to make sure that we are being very clear on what we're trying to accomplish so that it is aligned specifically to the goals and objectives of the organization. So we want to be consistent. We want to enable people to think about the enterprise, so to think globally, but also to act locally. We want to make sure that it's simple enough that people are actually accepting and using the guidelines that we're providing and the tools that we're providing through data governance. Um, many times using that alignment process can help to uh, encourage people to use um, the data governance program, tools, artifacts, et cetera. We also want to make sure we're very deliberate on who needs to do what. So again, thinking about that process of vision to purpose to picture to plan and participation, we need to be very clear on that. And lastly, it's important to communicate. Communicate, 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 because that's really what ties this all together and creates an effective uh, change. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up and turn it back to you, Shannon. Thank you. Kelly, thank you so much for this great presentation. Uh, Kelly will be joining you in the group chat over the next 10 minutes to go over questions and comments of the presentation. Following that, there will be a 10-minute break where we encourage you to network and check out all the great sponsor booths before the next session begins at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, where we will hear from a panel discussing to, how to govern data definition through data modeling.